Before I talk about the subject that I plan to talk about, I have a comment on something else. There is a news item that the Prime Minister has been called in to be interviewed on the matter of the submarines, and he will be asked to answer questions that give us no rest regarding the um, security system. Mr. Prime Minister, why did you give permission to the Germans to sell submarines to the Egyptians without getting, without consulting with anyone else in the security establishment, the Minister of Defense, and so on? I'm not speaking as a politician. I'm familiar with the case and with cases and with m facts that are not made public. He was not a secondary actor. He uh, orchestrated the whole matter and was involved in every mattering and all what the other uh, three people involved did. There's no dispute. Money changed hands under the table. The people closest to the prime minister made a profit. And if he knew that, he needs to go to prison. If he didn't know that, then something must have happened to him. I've known Mr. Netanyahu for more than 20 years. Tw Netanyahu of the past would never have let that pass under the radar. If the strategic meaning of this is that he didn't know, then he is not competent to be the prime minister. That is state security. It is the holy of holies, and we cannot uh, let that pass. That's what I want to say on that subject, but the subject that I have come to speak about is also connected because it's a matter of values. The way in which values work in the service of the national security system, the strength of a country always works in the balance of the values. The army traditionally is in charge of strength and the politicians dealt with the politics. In the past, it has been the army that has halted the unbridled use of force, whereas the politicians look at that as a matter for weaklings. And I participate in quite a number of discussions on national security in the, in the past in the cabinet and today in various uh, Knesset committees and in this forum. And the participants are politicians and military people. And in many of the cases, I would say too many of the cases, when we spoke about national security, the politicians were those who talk, talked about the security, and it was the military people who talked about the national aspect. The politicians preferred to talk about the battlefield and the enemies and the risks and responses and so on, and the military people were the ones who asked the difficult questions about morality and about economic and political issues and about the built-in tension that exists when you fight terror, terror that does not recognize the laws and the need to observe those laws. And the politicians talk about being tough when fighting terror, and it was the military people warned us against letting the terrorists bring us down to their level. They were the ones who told us that Hamas and, and Islamic Jihad are creating a culture of blood and death, and Israel represents values of hope and freedom. And the day we accept their standards will also be the day that we lose the war. What is the reason for this exchange of roles? The interest of the politicians is clear. All the talk about being tough, we live in a world of sound bites and pictures, a chaotic world that is looking for a feeling of security, even if it's fake, even if it's temporary and fleeting. And the problem is that too many people have very determined opinions that are based on very few facts, even when they are presented with established facts that run counter to their uh, resolved opinions, they're not willing to listen. So the politicians are always asking themselves, what does the public prefer? The statesman who has his picture taken wearing a leather flying jacket and binoculars, or a, a statesman that explains the complexities of policy to them, the fact that military people are offering an opposite view is not only for moral reasons, but perhaps first and foremost 
because of organizational memory in democratic states, armies, and other security organizations are today the organizations that maintain the organization memory best. In Israel, it's striking because the army uh, gains experience in a linear uh, fashion and it maintains its memory and learns the lessons and passes them on to the next generation. In politics, every government wants to erase everything that the previous government did. Politicians are elected based on the promise that they will, they will not continue the politics of the previous government and they will break agreements. And in the army, they do just the opposite. They relate to the past as the basis for the present. They shape the future battlefield as a conclusion of those that preceded it. Gabi Ashkenazi once told me that in all his many decades of service, he always had a note in his pocket with the names of all those who were who were killed while they served with him. And besides the fact that it's very touching, it is also a very broad organizational perspective on the cost of war. The army's organizational memory is long enough and goes back far enough to remember that force building and um, managing uh, war doesn't start or end with the army. You need an economy and, a, and solidarity among your civil society and policy. It's true everywhere and in Israel even more so because we are a country of eight million people that is surrounded by an Islamic expanse of half a billion people and we must preserve our qualitative age. It's true that the battlefield where this qualitative edge is given expression, but it is not built on the battlefield. It is built in Washington and in Jerusalem, and it is built in the first grade in every school in Israel, and it is built in Weizmann Institute and in the Supreme Court and in the high-tech park in Beersheba. The Israeli security system talks about Israeli society not only out of a sense of mission, but also because there are stakeholders. The security system understands that Israel's economic strength, its innovation, civil rights, human rights, democracy, these are the basis for its qualitative edge. Values are the qualitative edge. As long as the politicians considered it their duty to preserve these values, then the army could focus on its professional aspects. When the politicians abandon these values, or even worse, attack them directly, the security establishment is forced to protect them in order to preserve its sources of strength. Unlike a lot of the dangerous nonsense that has been spoken in Israel, in the past couple years, the head of the security establishment are not left-wingers. What they have is an organization member. They know that an army that does not preserve its clear values will be harmed operationally. The struggle is everywhere. Even in the question of what should the wording of the memorial is for player that the army says and how women should be treated in the army and how a wounded terrorist should be treated. In the armies of all the Western world, the fact is noted that people with values and integrity will always be better officers and soldiers than bullies that came to the army just to look for a place to channel their aggression. And in the organizational memory of every army is the fact that no army in the modern age can create all the arms that it needs and all the weapons that it needs. And consequently, the quality of its weapons will be equal to its alliances. And in the organizational memory of every commander in the army is the fact that if once you allow your soldiers to take the law into their own hand, then you will never be able to move the wheel back. They will never be your soldiers again. The army has one chain of command, and only one. 
Rabbis are not part of that chain of command. Rabbis belong in the community and in the synagogue and in the yeshiva. And the army will continue to recruit women for all roles, and we are proud of these women. And the army must show zero tolerance to those who refuse to serve and those to call on those who refuse to serve from right and from left. The need for clear values has increased in recent years because we're living in a new age. There is hardly a place in the world we've talked about it. We're hardly seeing clashes between two organized armies. Most of the fighting is asymmetrical between uh, terrorist entities or states that use terrorist entities. The war has no borders, and not only physical borders, but moral borders. How do you fight uh, um, an, or an enemy like Hamas, Hamas that uses its own children as a human shield, that's willing to sacrifice its own children for a picture in the paper? This is extremely confusing on a moral level, and it upsets the balance between diplomacy and confrontation, between realism and ideology, between using force and keeping the law. Many people in Israel, including in the government, maintain today that that, that's, that we cannot contend with radical terror with our hands tied behind our back by the laws of the enlightened West, that in a war of this kind, democratic values are an unnecessary weakness. They are wrong twice. Once, morally, if we accept the standards of our enemies, we have lost the war. Uh, that is where they're trying to bring us down to. They want us to make us like them. They want us to wage a war without laws and without borders because their bigger goal is to turn Israel into an illegitimate state. Their greater goal is that there be equality, that they can show the world that the state of the world and the terrorists are behaving the same way. We must not allow them that victory. If we give up our democratic identity, that is a weakness. And in the Middle East, you must not show any weakness. The second time this thesis is wrong is in practical terms. The only place where the required strength for an ongoing battle against tyranny and terror is an open democratic society. It was true in the case of Hitler, and it's no less true in the war on terror. Democracy creates better technology and better soldiers and officers and a better economy and a series of strategic alliances. It's not only just, it's also more effective. And it's not enough for democracy to defend us, we must defend it too. We must defend the institutions that comprise it, the constant balance that enables, enables it to exist. Our politics are becoming ugly increasingly ugly. The social media have created uh, a world with an attention disorder that moves from tweet to tweet. It's difficult to remember under these conditions that only long-term processes create flourishing countries and all these other things only harm it. There are quite a number of people in Israel, including in the government, that want to live in a democracy but don't want to pay the price of democracy. They want to enjoy a strong economy and American uh, arms and uh, unwavering support from America and commerce with Europe and the volunteering of their younger generation to fight. But they don't want a strong Supreme Court and they don't want freedom of speech and a freedom free press and a fear free press and they don't want to observe international law. There is no such creature and there's no such life and there's no such possibility. True patriots know that democracy is not just rights, it's also duties and responsibilities. The army understands it. The political system wants to enjoy all the worlds, but it will lose all those worlds if it does so. The, we must bring to the center of politics the same level of commitment and responsibility that we find in the security system. There's a great temptation to choose the populist solution. Even politicians that know the truth tell themselves, that's what the public wants. I know it's wrong, but I'll say it to get elected or just to get re-elected. And they tell themselves, after I'm re-elected, I'll do the right thing. 
They won't. Because they've already betrayed themselves. They've already capitulated to their voters instead of leading them. I believe in the Israeli public, and I believe in Israelis, and I believe that they do want responsibility, that they understand the complexity, that they don't want to be fooled, and they don't want the... Uh, uh, they don't want politicians to appeal to the worst among them. I know that it's also worthwhile politically to behave in a moral and ethical way, especially in light of all the things that happened in the past year, the Temple Mount and El Azari and the Supreme Court and so on. The IDF is still the most beloved and esteemed entity in Israeli society. Responsible leadership must come from the center and not from the extremes. True leadership always begins in the same place, with the ability to tell your people the truth even when it's uncomfortable, even when it's difficult. And the truth is that there are no silver bullets. It's true that the reality is com complex, and without a strong democracy, we won't have a state of Israel. The populist and violent discourse that has dominated the, the Knesset and the government uh, and the politicians weakens us. It weakens our national resilience. We must offer the Israeli public something that is better than a flattery for the angry masses. We must offer responsibility in the long term that arises from the knowledge that national security is based, first of all, on the right values. Thank you very much.